the show called Lizzie McGuire. Be in that, that world of, of Hilary Duff. She was really turned into a movie star. Cinderella 91423. Hillary had the dramatic chops. Hey, Team Duff, it's Wit. Thanks so much for listening to Duff Enough, the ultimate Hillary Duff fan podcast. This show is a celebration of the life and career of actress, singer, mother, and all around icon, Hillary Duff. Well, some of your favorite Hilary Duff movies and episodes of Lizzie McGuire wouldn't be the same without my next guest in the director's chair. Mark Rosman directed the big screen hits A Cinderella Story and The Perfect Man, along with multiple Lizzie episodes and other TV hits for Disney like Even Stevens and Life Size. I'm very excited to welcome to the show film and TV director, writer, and producer, Mark Rosman. Thanks so much for being on Deaf Enough. Thanks, Wit. Are you ready for a little trip down memory lane? (laughs) I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. Well, obviously, we're going to talk about Lizzie, A Cinderella Story, The Perfect Man. But before we get to the Hillary era of your career, let's start with some other projects that are well known and beloved by millennials. You did a few wonderful world of Disney movies on ABC, namely in the year 2000, Model Behavior starring Maggie Lawson and Justin Timberlake, and Hello, Shine Bright, Shine Far, Be a Star. You directed Lindsay Lohan and Tyra Banks in Life Size. So how did the door really open for you at Disney? Well, I had sort of two time periods um, there at Disney. Uh, Before all that, in the mid-80s, good friend of mine who um, I had gone to college with, um, NYU Film School, got the chance to write and direct the very first Disney Channel TV movie. It was called Tiger Town. And after that, he was offered, um, him and his producer were offered like a deal to bring in other projects. And Alan Shapiro, that was his name, he called me and said, do you have anything for Disney? And I came up with an idea and I went in and I pitched the idea. It was called The Blue Yonder. And it was my second film. It was made in 1985. And they offered me um, another movie. And that was a film called Spot Marks the X. <laughs> hmm. And so I had done those kind of back to back with The Blue Yonder and, and uh, Spot Marks the X. And then um, I went off, did some other things more not really in the family genre, more in kind of suspense, thriller sort of genres. And I was always looking for scripts. And a friend of mine sent me a script called Ken and Barbie about a doll that comes to life and the middle school girl who has to deal with that. Because I had some connection at that point with Disney, I submitted it and they uh, bought it. The writer and I, um, Stephanie Moore, collaborated on a number more drafts, wondering if they would ever make this movie. And then they finally did. They said, we're going to make it. And have you ever heard, sit down because we're going to tell you who we're casting in this. There's this supermodel. I don't know if you've ever heard of Tyra Banks. And I was like, whoa. I mean, it was really interesting because here's Disney really getting into diversity back in uh, 2000. I mean, we're talking 21 years ago. Yeah. They did it and they jumped in and I was nervous because Tyra had never acted in anything and I was just worried, you know, is she going to be able to to act? We had uh, Lindsay Lohan and the amazing thing was is that Tyra was obviously, uh, you know, new to acting, but she just jumped off of the screen. And the connection between her and Lindsay was fantastic. And it's funny that you sing the song. I, I'm always so surprised when, you know, people have come up to me and they go, oh, you did Life Side, and they start singing me that song. Right. Um, so we needed a, a theme song for the, the toy, which was the doll. And there was a guy who we had hired in Vancouver, which was where we shot it, to be kind of the, uh, the band leader because there was a scene where they were going to have this band that was going to play this song. He wrote the music. I wrote the lyrics, like literally on the back of an envelope kind of thing. And we put it together. And here I am. It's the only song I've ever written, but I'm proud of it. It was fun. And then what was really fun about it was um, the cast completely got into that song while we were shooting it. And we had like 
15 minutes left in our day, you know, before we had to call it quits. And I said, hey, everybody, <laughs> let's do the song. And Lindsay was like, yeah, let's do the song. Let's do the song. And Tyra was like, yeah, let's do the song. And so we did it. And everybody there, you know, Jerry Burns, who was the father and everybody there is doing the dance. It was hysterical. And that became the ending of our of our movie. So mm. I can't believe I'm talking to not only the director of Life Size, but the person who wrote the lyrics for Be A Star. I mean, what is happening right now? <laughs> yeah, and that just also reminded me that part of the reason it was called Be A Star was in the original script, uh, the name of the doll was Star. Mm. That was her name. And when we came to start to shoot the movie, on every movie before you begin shooting, you have to do what's called a title report where you submit the script to this law firm and they go through the script and they see if you have anything like people's names that if there's only one other person with that same name living in the United States, you can't use it because that person will say, hey, that's me. Now, if there's 300 people with that name, you're okay. So they flagged Star. They said, uh, you know, Star, uh, Mattel's got a a doll in development. Uh, This company's got something, can't use it. Um, I I don't know, the company itself either suggested, here's a woman's name that isn't in development anywhere as a doll. How about that? And that's kind of how we came up with Eve. So be a star though, it's fine to say it in obviously in in a song like this. Yeah, yeah. Well, Eve is great no matter where she goes. Dress her up <laughs> from her head to her toes. Yeah, and uh, we could do a whole podcast on on Life Size, honestly. But really quick model behavior, Justin Timberlake's first movie. So he was, yeah, it was, I don't know who came up with the idea. It wasn't me who came up with the idea. Let's get Justin Timberlake. And I remember I had lunch with him before we started. And, and he was like, you know, a little nervous. And, you know, how are we going to do this? And he cautioned me, he said, you know, um, I have all these fans that, you know, if we're shooting out in the street, you got to watch out. And so we bols- bolstered the security and everything. There was always a crowd when we shot him out on the street there. We shot that in Toronto, but he was great. He was just, you know, really into it, really a sweet guy. And then when we finished the film, we had a, we wanted to show it to him. And he said, sure, you know, I'll come by with my girlfriend. <laughs> uh, well, that was Britney Spears. And so they showed up <laughs> for the, the screening. And that was really fun to show them. And uh, yeah, he was, he was wonderful. Love it. And love that movie too. And not too long after Life Size and Model Behavior, you directed two episodes of Even Stevens, uh, according to IMDb, from the first season, Family Picnic, and Luscious Lou. So now you've got your foot in the door at Disney Channel. What was it like working on on that show? Because a lot of Lizzie fans also grew up with, with Even Stevens. Yeah, so this was very early on in the world of what's called single camera comedy. Mm -hmm. Up until then, almost every television comedy was shot in the sitcom kind of style, where you have these multiple cameras and a live audience kind of shooting it live, which was not something I did and have never done. It's a very different directorial style. I was trying to get into, at that time, it was, the, it was around 2000, I was trying to get into series television as a director to, to do these shows. And I met with Sean McNamara, who had produced um, Even Stevens, and we hit it off. We're still friends today. And I got to do this episode, uh, Family Picnic. And it was really fun. Shia was a very interesting kid. He had a point of view about stuff. He wasn't like you know, some of the other kid actors that I'd worked with, which were just, you know, gung-ho, I'll do whatever you want. Shia was, um, you know, really special. He had a, um, a really interesting quality to him. And then the whole, the whole family around him was, was fantastic. Uh, you know, we were, we meaning all the directors on those shows were really encouraged to push the envelope and come up with really interesting shots, try and make it as visual and as fun as possible. I mean, even Stevens did all, so many different kind of visual techniques, like really fast motion, then kind of re- into regular motion and a lot of different fun things. So I had a lot of fun as a director doing those. Um, they really liked my work. Yeah. And um, my agent called me and said that the Disney Channel would like to hire me to do another show, this show called Lizzie McGuire. Ah. 
Yeah. And they and at first I actually turned them down because what they said is we but we need somebody there. We're just starting the show. We need you to do like two episodes back to back, like right, you know. And I was like, I felt like I was just, even though I'd done a lot of movies, I was just getting my feet wet in the TV series world. Mm -hmm. And so I said, God, I don't know. I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do one, but two back to back. I was worried I wasn't up to it. It's like preparing or, you know, doing pre-production on two episodes at the same time. It's tough. Yeah. Yeah. They said, okay, fine. Well, we got somebody else to do the opening couple episodes, but, you know, we need somebody for episode four or whatever it was, uh, When Moms Attack, I think it was called. Um, yeah, yeah. No, so I said yes to that and uh, went over there. Well, you directed 11 episodes of Lizzie McGuire in total, and I've got to list them because, I mean, some of them are the most iconic, and fans, if they don't know, they're going to lose their minds here. But season one, When Moms Attack, my personal favorite episode of Misadventures and Babysitting, Between a Rock and a Bra Place, Sibling Bonds, Educating Ethan, Facts of Life, and then in season two, Just Friends, Inner Beauty, Moving On Up, Dear Lizzie, and My Fair Larry. So as fans pick their jaws up off the ground right now, where do we even start? Take me back to those days on Lizzie. Well, I mean, the first thing to know about it is that um, Hillary Duff was not famous. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A lot of these episodes you would have done before it was even on the air or even a hit. That's right. Exactly. And so, you know, this was just another show. You know, this was not any kind of, oh, you're doing a Hillary Duff. Nobody knew who Hillary Duff was. Um, again, they were really into let's make this as visual and as fun, as fast paced as possible. They they had this clever thing of, the, of, you know, hearing Lizzie, her inner Lizzie speak. And so we had to kind of learn how to shoot that. And it was great. They had the set, they had everything already going. Uh, the family of uh, those actors were terrific. They, they were already kind of right in the groove of it um, by the episode I did. Everybody was totally clicked into their characters. And Hillary was... I got to say, you know, very consistent from that episode all the way through to when she was famous. She didn't change. She was sweet, giving, patient, and very professional. Did you see the, the star power or the potential? I think after a couple episodes, I did feel like, wow, she's, you know, she just has the comic timing of like Lucille Ball. You know, she's just, uh, you know, amazing. And I do remember, I, I don't know when it happened, but I remember one episode where she, we were working on, she came back to the set and she was talking about how she went to a mall and people recognized her. So it was after they finally started to air them, she was really turned into a movie star. Yeah. What's your favorite episode you directed? I think it was the bra episode. I mean, I, you know, I have a daughter. Um, she was younger six years old when I was doing those episodes, uh, even younger, about four. And so I wasn't quite at that point yet, but I was thinking to myself, when I get to that point, I'm now going to have some tools of how to deal with this and what to listen to and what their concerns are. What I loved about it was, here's a kid's show, quote unquote, that's mm -hmm. dealing with something kind of edgy, what would be considered edgy, you know, a bra, like you don't, you didn't see that in Leave it to Beaver. You know, you didn't see that in, in these uh, in, in kid shows and um, or even family shows. So it was really fun to deal with that. I thought the writing of it was, was great. Um, I really went for it when she finally blurts out, I want a bra, <laughs> you know, really hit that moment. And, you know, they're so nervous about it. And then, and how Hallie Todd, you know, playing the mom was just so kind of <laughs> in her, so proud of the fact that her daughter um, was getting a bra it was just so perfect and fun and what a great contrast and conflict with, with Lizzie. It kind of encapsulated, I think, uh, her Lizzie's whole character and her dilemma with her parents and, uh, and her growing up. That's what it was really about her growing up. I didn't know this had happened, but somebody recently told me about the online like reunion that mm -hmm. she did, and they did that episode, and then I watched it, and it was really a, a, a stroll down memory lane, and so great to see them all. Yeah, I loved that. What did you make of 
you know, the phenomenon that Lizzie became at that time. I mean, that was something that you had played a part in and it was this huge success. Yeah, it's funny. Um, I did, I, I certainly played a part in it. I don't think I at all like caused it or anything, but I remember when the word tween came into to Vogue and that was right around then. And this, this whole idea that kids between, you know, sort of middle school and getting into high school had a voice. They were buying things, they were saying things, they were stars of things, they were becoming, you know, here's a a segment of the population that maybe wasn't really looked at. There was certainly a lot of like high school age uh, um, celebrities, but not this sort of tween celebrity and, and how tweens were, you know, experiencing things like like how you would be open about a bra and um, how, you know, more of an openness with their, with their bodies and able to discuss these things. It was never, I think, thought before that, that someone in middle school would really be ready for that, but they were maturing quicker. That happened. And then Hillary just became, you know, just because that show, Lizzie McGuire delved into the mind of a uh, middle schooler. She just, you know, captured it. And it was kind of ground zero for the tween movement. That tween girl power rom-com era of the early 2000s. I don't really know where that went, but it was such a moment in, in you as a director for these films that were a part of it. So, so yeah. The year that Cinderella Story came out, I believe that was 2004, every month, there was a tween girl movie. You know, Lindsay was in about three of them. Hillary was in a couple. Every, you know, girl from that um, time was in a couple. And, you know, it had to run its course and not to get ahead of the interview, but it sort of felt like the perfect man was almost at the very end of that cycle. Yeah, yeah. Kind of uh, wrapping up on Lizzie, I guess, a little bit here. We're actually recording this shortly after the 20th anniversary. And unfortunately, shortly after Hillary announced that the reboot for Disney Plus has been canceled. So did you have any thoughts on that? You know, they were going to do this more adult version of Lizzie. And I found that interesting that I wanted to ask you that because Life Size 2 kind of took that approach. I didn't necessarily love what they did with Life Size 2, but I think it would have worked for Lizzie. Yeah, I I don't know a lot about it. I do know what you what you said and I and I felt very proud of Hillary for making that stand. Boy, I mean, who wouldn't have jumped at doing that? Um and she sort of made the stand of, you know, if this is about Lizzie McGuire now as a 30-year-old, uh let's do this real, not just, you know, some kind of fake um inauthentic uh, piece. And so I was really proud of her for doing that. I kind of don't understand why they didn't do it that way. I mean, why not? Yeah. I guess they had their reasons. Um, I think it would have been a really fun show. Um, Life Size, um, I've actually not seen it. I was a little irked that I wasn't involved in it. That's the way, you know, Hollywood works. And I, I think I read somewhere that um, Tyra, you know, I think she felt... I might be a little too old fashioned and they kind of wanted something a little more edgy or whatever. Um, Mm, You would have been better. Probably. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's get to a Cinderella story now. And as much as fans love Lizzie McGuire, the Lizzie McGuire movie, a lot of people would say that this is their favorite Hilary Duff movie. And I think that says a lot. So you'd worked with Hillary on Lizzie. Now this project comes along. Who was attached to it first, you or, or Hill? What's the story there? A different friend now um, sends me a script. The, the writer had written and never gone anywhere. And it was called Cinderella 91423. So those numbers refer to the uh, zip code in Sherman Oaks. Okay. Sherman Oaks, California, where the Valley Girl was born this the whole idea was cinderella kind of as a valley girl in in a sense and definitely the the writer here was a more of a new fledgling writer named lee dunlap and i I gave lee some ideas for how to kind of restructure it a little bit and she did those we brought it back to this producer that had been attached, a guy named Cliff Werber. My idea was this was going to be a Disney Channel TV movie. I sent it in. 
And they said, you know what? We don't do love stories where love is really the driving A story. It could be on a, you know, a B story, but not the A story, which really was Cinderella is. And so I thought, okay, project's dead. Nothing's going to happen with it. And this was at a time when, um, you know, Lizzie McGuire was uh, a hit TV show, but Hillary had not done a feature yet. The Lizzie McGuire movie had not happened. And Cliff said, well, I think this could be a feature. Do you know any, you know, stars you could give it to? I said, well, I know too, uh, Lindsay Lohan and, um, and Hillary. And so we said, well, why don't we try Hillary? And so I had a really good relationship, um, not only with Hillary, but with Susan, uh, Hillary's mom. Mm-hmm. Susan was still very much kind of Hillary's in a way you could say producer, you know, sort of really read all the scripts probably first before showing them to Hillary. And so I called Susan and I said, you know, I've got the script for you. And I sent it to her. I still remember the day she called back and said, uh, Mark, um, I read the script and I'm waiting for her to say, you know, great, but sorry. And she goes, and I think um, I'd like to see Hillary attached to this project as the star of, of it. And I'm like, my jaw just dropped. I was mm-hmm. like, oh my God, this is amazing. Before we sent it to Hillary, uh, Cliff sent it to the studios without any actors attached to be a feature film. It was passed on by every single studio. They said, we like it, but you know, maybe if you come back with a, an actor attached, we'll be interested. So that's when Cliff said, do you know anybody? We've got Hillary. Everybody, every studio is looking to make a movie with her, and we had a good script that she was attached to. Um, the timing couldn't have been more perfect. And suddenly, four out of the seven studios wanted to buy it. And we had what's called a bidding war, where they had to really bid against each other to, to get it. And Cliff managed the whole thing, decided on that we'd go with Warner Brothers, because uh, the other studios said, we love it. I think we need to give it a little the script, a little more development, and then... If we like it, then we'll green light it as a movie. Warner Brothers was saying, yeah, the script could use a little work, but we're green lighting it. You are shooting. It was like a January or February. We're giving you a start date of shooting in June, no matter what, we're guaranteeing that. And so, you know, we said, we're going with you guys. And so they ended up the winner of that bidding war. And like the next day, Cliff and I are standing in these vacant offices on the Warner Brothers lot, pinching ourselves going, can you believe this? Uh, Cliff had never produced a movie at all. He was a lawyer at uh, 20th Century Fox. And me, I had done, you know, a number of TV movies like we talked about in series, but those TV movies, the budgets of those are about $3 million. This was to be a $18 million studio feature film so it was a huge jump for me yeah and certainly for cliff and we were like oh my god can you believe this so that's kind of the genesis of how it happened so your first feature film i mean that's pretty awesome and so the cast here you have hillary how did the rest of the cast kind of fall in line it's interesting it's almost like we had the same casting pool as freaky friday with the love interest in the mean girl uh but i mean jennifer coolidge and regina king i mean wow well first of all we didn't it wasn't like oh automatically let's use chad uh i mean just right there we had to find him and so we obviously auditioned you know the 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 top um the top people at the time and we in fact did a screen test which i believe is on a um the special edition kind of thing Mm -hmm. and we did a screen test with like you know five or six of the top guys Uh, jared pedalecki was one of them and there was a few others um and chad and her just really did have a great chemistry chad had this maturity to him and he was you know he or she was about 15 and a half at the time and Chad was like 20 or something. Uh, so he, you know, he definitely had uh, the maturity. Um, but something about their chemistry just really worked. So that's how Chad got on board. The Jennifer Coolidge thing was really an interesting thing. We had actually made an offer and was about to hire, there, and I can't remember her name, there were these two women who had a very successful show in England. 
and they were kind of almost like a comedy team or something. And we hired one of them. And I've got to give credit to Dylan Sellers, who was one of the producers who said, Oh my God, we should really look at Jennifer Coolidge. Hmm. We did. And we got the script to her and she said, yes. And that was, you know, just brilliant. I mean, she was amazing and just brought, uh, you know, an edge to her. In fact, I mean, when I worked with her, I had to kind of tone her down because there were some choices she wanted to do that was just not PG-13 anymore, that it was really much more, much more adult. And, and she was kind of like, Mark, why did you hire me? And I can't do these things. And I said, well, it's a kind of a family movie here, you know? So, but she was just amazing. Um, and, and then uh, Regina King, now that was a whole story as well. In the original script, that role did not exist. There was a different role and it was very funny. The, the role was um, Hillary was this waitress in this diner and one of the regular customers to always be there was a woman who claimed in the script to be the very first Valley girl. She was the one who, and she says in the script, you know that phrase, gag me with a spoon? Yep, that was me. And, and we were headed down the line of, of using that character. And again, I believe it was Dylan who said, you know, we need to have a, a, some diversity in this cast. Let's do a fairy godmother kind of character who's really the protector. And um, that's how that came about. And again, you know, that was inspired. It was, Regina was fantastic. And she's, of course, you know, have, has done some amazing performances. So, Oh, I remember when she went up to get her Oscar. I was like, oh, my goodness, it's Rhonda. Rhonda, yeah, she was great. I love the, the moment when she's, like, about to fight. <laughs> and she takes off her earrings. I love that moment. Yeah. Uh, and then Carter, the best friend, Dan Bird, that was another sort of key change from the script. In the script, there was the, the, the best friend, and he had um, two dads. There was a whole thing where he believed that he was gay, but was wondering about it because he kept having feelings for women. Hmm. So he, there was a scene in the script where he had to come to his two gay dads and say, dads, I'm not gay. And we discussed it a lot at Warner Brothers. And at that time, Warner Brothers didn't want to, to go there. Too soon, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. We were just a bit too soon. And so, yeah. Um, a cameo, um, the guy from um, Big Bang Theory. Big Bang Theory, yes. Um, Simon Helberg. Simon Helberg. So that came about because one of the writers, we had several people who came in and did kind of rewrites on the scripts. And one of them said, you've got to audition this guy. He's amazing. And I said, how old is he? And he's like 27, but he looks like he could be in high school. I go, really? And so we, we brought him in and he was, fan and this was this tiny role, really. Yeah. But he did a lot with it and he was great. And now he's like a superstar. Mm. Fantastic cast, obviously. Let's hear some behind the scenes uh, stories and tidbits because you all shot this at a real high school? We did. It was in Monrovia, California, which is east of Los Angeles. Uh, not too far, but um, sort of in the Pasadena area, um, east of Los Angeles, a real high school. We, we took it over. Um, I think the school was actually still in session. Well, and then we just kind of closed certain sections of it. The, the toughest scene in many, many ways was the finale with the rain and the, in the stands when he um, leaves the football game and uh, runs up to the stands and kisses her we were dealing with them. Um, Hillary was under 16 and um, the way the Screen Actors Guild, which is the union that handles all the actors, there are rules. They like, you can only shoot up to a certain time. It was about 10 o'clock at night. And we were making the film in the summer when it gets dark late, right? So if you want to shoot a nighttime scene outside at night, um, you can't really start shooting till about eight. And at 10 o'clock, she was gone. They pulled her. The they meaning there was like a you know a studio teacher who you know was aware of the hours and would and would pull her. So that was a, a very difficult time. We we basically 
got the shot, the big wide shot where it starts to rain and the camera's pulling back and we got that and we kind of rushed through trying to get some close-ups and the close-ups weren't working and we called it a night and we didn't, couldn't shoot there the next night. So, so the studio agreed that we could restage just the close-ups on a sound stage. Um, we got some bleachers and we got extras to be kind of in the background and then it's just dark, so you don't see that you're not in on a football field or anything. And we redid those. Um, but before we did that, I had to do a little work with Hillary and Chad mm-hmm. because we realized that, you know, Hillary was 15 and a half and wasn't that experienced with kissing and was a little intimidated, I think, by Chad, who was five years older than her. So my solution at the time, and I don't know if this was a help or not, but I, I called uh, Hillary and Chad to come into my trailer. This is, you know, before like shooting one day. And I said, you know, we're going to be redoing about a week from now. We're going to redo the close-ups of the kiss. And I just want Hillary to feel relaxed and not feel so uptight about it. So I want you two to kiss in front of me a number of times. Just kiss, kiss, kiss. I wanted to try and get it so that Hillary just goes, oh God, not another kiss kind of thing. Um, so we could get her more relaxed with it. So we did that a bunch of times. And, and, I, I, and I said, you know, at first I'm just going to be here watching you because there's going to be 50 people or more, like 100 people watching you. So I want you to just feel relaxed around somebody actually watching you. And then I'm going to leave and let you guys kiss for a little while just on your own. So we did that. And again, I'm not sure if that helped or not, but she, when we did come to shoot the close-ups, we got some really nice footage of them of them kissing finally. It worked. It worked. I love that movie magic behind the scenes info. Any other like major movie magic stuff that might blow fans' minds from the production? One other time we were we were dri- doing some of the driving scenes when when her and Carter are driving that gorgeous Mercedes, that old Mercedes car. And there was a time, and you know, when you shoot these driving scenes, the actors aren't actually driving. You've got a a big, uh, kind of like a big tow truck, it looks like. And all the camera crew and the lights are all on this tow truck, basically. And And the actors are in the car being towed. And there's lights shining on them. And they're wearing little mics. And, and I'm watching it on the tow truck. The whole crew was like sitting on the back of the tow truck and we're watching in little monitors. And we hit that 10 o'clock time because remember that was a nighttime scene where they're um, being chased. We're in the middle of a shot and Troy, who was um, the kind of studio teacher. Oh, we know Troy. You know, Troy, great. Yeah, back from the Lizzie McGuire days. He was the greatest guy, I love him. We have this outtake probably somewhere where he comes in and says, Hillary, you got to go. And she, you know, we're right in the middle of some street in the valley. And, and, and literally, he just pulls her out of the shot. Um, but luckily, we were able the next day to kind of finish that. Um, the other time that we were really under the gun was the gazebo scene. Ah, iconic. You know, if you look at that scene, you'll see all these different angles. We were, the camera's sweeping around, all this stuff. And that takes a lot of time to shoot that stuff. And we were up against it. And Hillary was such a pro that um, she was just right on. Do you have a favorite scene? Wow. Um, Let's see. Um, Oh, I also have to mention this is a little tidbit. In that diner scene, when we first meet, when the stepmother in the montage kind of falls into the arms of the dad, in that little birthday scene is my daughter. She throws a little French fry at, um, at the young Hillary. And I still get little emails from the girl who played uh, the young Hillary. But I guess, you know, that sequence when uh, the wall kind of peels away and they see the inscription and that whole kind of climax scene there, that and I would say the kiss in the rain. One other thing just about that scene is the, st- the studio really wanted us to use for the song. What we played musically during that scene is uh, the Rain song, which was a big hit. Oh, Come Clean. Yeah, Come Clean. 
And I liked the song, but it didn't have the triumph feel to me. It, it was kind of an angry, it had a bit of an angry tone to it. Mm-hmm. And the, the studio was like, what? Why? You're, you, you know, rain, let the rain come down. I mean, it's like perfect. And yes, it was perfect, but I just didn't like the tone of it. I wanted something so heartwarming and upbeat. So we ended up reusing a, a song that was had played earlier that was much more upbeat. Yeah, and I wanted to ask about the soundtrack. I mean, it was a huge success. Number one on the Billboard soundtracks chart, nine overall, certified gold. Did you have much input in the soundtrack? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I listened, you know, er, picking all those songs. We had a music supervisor named Deborah Baum that came up with songs um, she came up with "I'll Be" the uh, you know the song of, for the gazebo, um, yeah. that was just amazing. That was perfect for it. Um, Our lips are sealed was this promo single with Hillary and Haley, not in the movie. And then also, why did they have songs that were recorded by Hillary on the soundtrack, but a different singer in the movie and kind of Jesse McCartney? Do you know anything about that? We didn't want the movie to be like every single song is Hillary Duff. We just thought it would not be appropriate. And so that was the main reason. And we knew we wanted about these three Hillary Duff songs. And that song at the end, which is not, I don't think, one of Hillary's big hits. Um, I love that song. Um, Anywhere But Here. Anywhere But Here. I love that song. And I really wanted that one in there. And uh, yeah, there was that, um, that, the ballad that, um, Hillary had done a version of. Frankly, we, it was a combination of we just didn't want every single song to be Hillary. And I just loved how this other performance was. And I just gotcha. thought it, it was really good. Now you know. Yeah. It was also a gorgeous song. Yeah. And the other one that Hillary sang was Crash World, which that was her. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. What memories do you have about the premiere of a Cinderella story? Yeah, that was amazing. You know, Hollywood Boulevard premiere. This was my first. Uh, ever premiere it was amazing the you know crowds of people lining hollywood boulevard it was like a classic old time premiere the studio sent a limousine to pick me and my family up my wife and my daughter and it was it was special my parents were there and you know my parents my dad uh, was a doctor he's passed away he didn't exactly understand the movie industry and kind of wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer and there he was, you know, kind of taking it all in and um, both of my parents. And so that was a magical moment for me. The only kind of negative thing about it was right afterwards, the film ends and we're in the lobby. Everybody's, you know, congratulating me, congratulating Hillary. And the writer comes up to me and says, um, you spelled my name wrong. Ah. And it was like, oh my God, the writer of the movie, it was Lee Dunlop and we spelled her name wrong. And I felt so horrible about it and the uh, the studio had to kind of throw away all these prints of the movie and remake them with with the uh, with it spelled correctly but um it was it was fabulous it was such a you know just magical night that's awesome and finally we've got to talk about the perfect man i mean this was a little more adult for hillary and more straight up rom-com i feel like so how did this movie come about yet again you're collabing with hillary so universal that the cinderella story was made for warner brothers we had we were getting towards the end of the editing process for a cinderella story it hadn't come out yet we were in the editing of it and uh, my agent tells me that universal has a movie that they've had in development with Hillary attached. It was one of the other projects Hillary was attached to. And they wanted to do it and they wanted to know if I'd be interested in directing it. They sent me the script. The thing that appealed to me was the idea of this mother-daughter relationship and, and of the chance of maybe working with uh, an actress of stature to play uh, with um, Hillary in it. So I took it on and we went through some um, rewrites with some other writers. We had this great producer, Mark Platt, who had you know, done tons of movies and uh, including Legally Blonde. And we ended up shooting most of it in Toronto. Did most of the shooting there. We had like one scene that was shot in New York, which was when uh, the scene when the, the mother and, um, and Hillary are talking under the Brooklyn Bridge. 
And it, it was actually a really wonderful experience. Um, finding the actress to play her mom was challenging. Um, and I think, frankly, at that time, Hillary was, even though, you know, incredibly famous, I think in the world of Hollywood, in the world of, uh, you know, studio movies, I think there were a lot of actresses who felt like she wasn't, that Hillary wasn't um, talented enough or that she had, her fame had come more for just kind of more celebrity sort of fame rather than from her talent. And right. I think, uh, I think some actresses steered away from it because they didn't want to be um, in a movie that was, that they perceived as maybe not being kind of an A-list type of movie and, and Heather embraced it. And I was, uh, you know, really happy to have her. She had not, in my eyes, had not really done something like that, which was like a little more down to earth. And that's how I wanted to, to play her. Not, not the typical Heather Locklear that we're all used to seeing, which is this super dolled up kind of vixen commanding sort of pr presence. And she needed to be more insecure. And I asked Heather, you know, well, are you going to be willing to, you know, not be really glamorous in this movie? And she said, sure. And she went for it, and um, I thought she ended up, you know, delivering a performance that was that was really authentic and um, and wonderful. Great behind the scenes stories, great memories involved with uh, with that production too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Hillary again, completely professional about everything. Worked really well with Heather and with Aria, who played the her younger sister was a great little triumvirate there. Mike O'Malley as Lenny was amazing. He was so amazing that the producers came to me and said, he's so charming. Lenny is so charming. We were worried that the audience is going to root for Heather Locklear to end up with Lenny. I said, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, yes, he's charming, but in a whole different way than Chris Noth, especially that, that, scene where Lenny is singing the song and mm -hmm. has to climb up the fire escape and Hillary and Ari are sitting at the window just kind of gasping at his bare belly as he slides down the window. That, that was, you know, in terms of a behind the scenes uh, glimpse at that sequence in particular, the apartment was actually a set that, that uh, the production designer built and the front of it from the outside was actually a real building, apartment building on a street in Toronto that to me captured a little bit of the Brooklyn sort of feel, had these nice bay windows and it was a little older. And so we had to meld the two and especially a shot like where Lenny's from the outside going down this window and you see Hillary and Aria in the window on the set, right? Mm. So, um, because there was no room like that in the real building. Uh, what we did was the set that we built wasn't just the interior. It had a little bit of the exterior right around the window. And so the, all the wider shots had to be done on location. And then we would match in all the other um, action. So it was challenging to do and singing that song and him you know, singing it live. And we did a pre-record of the song that he was singing against. But that, that was kind of one of, for me, one of my favorite moments there. And I love that you all were able to incorporate so much of Hillary's uh, physical comedy into this movie, too. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the fire escape with the flowers, the up and down, the, um, all of that, the, uh, the sprinklers going on. And um, that was also a, a huge moment in capturing that beautiful slow motion end of that scene where she has that um, look towards her mom. And, yeah. Uh, that was a really nice moment. Um, her connection with, you got to help me out on his name. I loved. Um, uh, Feldman, Ben Feldman. Yeah, Ben Feldman. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. He just has such a great charisma to him. He's funny. He's charming. So he just really sparked with Hillary and played off each other, you know, really well. Uh, Carson Kressley. You know, it was so fun in it and, and, and funny. And he came up with some great lines that are in it. And so, yeah, I just, I do have a lot of fond memories of that. 
I Will Learn to Love Again. Love that song so much. Did you pick that out? And that's definitely my favorite scene, I think, in the movie. Ah, yeah. um, I didn't. It was, um, I believe, um, we had a different music supervisor. And he, I think he found that song. I think when we actually shot the scene, we hadn't picked the song yet. And so when you do something like that, you kind of have a, a guess at the tempo of the song because that's what you dance to is the tempo. And mm-hmm. so we just sort of picked this tempo that we thought would be great. And so the, when we eventually recorded the song, it had to kind of match that tempo. And we had a choreographer that helped with that whole dance sequence. It was really fun on the set there. And I also, one of my other favorite scenes in, in it is when, Um, She is writing to posing as the perfect man and writing to her mother. And they're kind of on two sides of a wall. You know, we have um, Heather in her apartment and Hillary is in the boy's apartment. We kind of visually sort of connect them. And I thought the little speech or monologue that Heather, when she's talking about how she gave up her career because she was pregnant, with with Hillary and Hillary has this really tearful moment. I thought it was just wonderful. And I don't think Hillary got the kind of attention or even the roles that took advantage of her dramatic uh, skills. She um, captured uh, the sort of angst and, and, a, and some deep sadness that she got in touch with that I thought was wonderful. And um, in fact, I really wanted her. There was a TV movie that I ended up not getting as the director, but I wanted to cast her in it. That was a very dramatic role about a, um, a girl who has cancer mm-hmm. and, um, and is not facing it. And I really wanted her in that. And uh, it ended up directed by somebody else, starring somebody else. But I always thought that Hillary um, had the dramatic chops. The fans are going to love to hear that because we have deep conversations about that sort of thing all the time. Well, before we wrap up, anything else about The Perfect Man? Yeah, it was also, again, another special, you know, movie for me. I think it um, was coming at the end of that big cycle. Um, of movies and it was was kind of at by the time it was released the idea of uh seeing another teen <laughs> a girl movie was not as appealing to people so it didn't do as well as as Cinderella's story and I think people struggled I think the critics struggled with sort of how to take it because like you say we were trying to do a real movie we were trying to do something a little more mature a little more grounded not so broad as a Cinderella story. And even in the photography of it, it was a little darker, a little, you know, it wasn't so poppy and colorful. And that was intentional. We wanted to make it a little more real. And I think some, I think audiences a little bit struggled with how to take that because they were expecting maybe one thing and getting pieces of that. There's certainly a lot of the fun Hillary in there, but there's some dramatic moments that I find are my, my favorite moments um, that I think Hillary delivered so well on. And I think people were having a whole shift of how they were going to see her. I wanted to touch on what you were saying about Hillary, uh, people not seeing her as sort of this actress and more of kind of the celebrity. I mean, you were seeing it just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And The Perfect Man was almost at the height of kind of her her teen stardom. So how busy was she at that time when you were making this movie? And, and what was it to kind of like be in that, that world of, of Hillary Duff? It was amazing. She was, um, she also, of course, had her recording career. So she was, you know, um, huge in the recording industry. And she had, you know, she was recording an album or she was on tour. It was tough just to book time with her. So I think that was a challenging time for her. I think it was, uh, and also she was growing up. She was on that cusp, you know, the innocent a uh, girl, middle school, high school girl, to getting older. The celebrities around her, you know, this is when Lindsay Lohan was starting to go in a different direction. You know, there was a war between them. And I mean, there was just a lot of stuff going on for her. And it was, it was difficult, I think, for her um, and challenging. And I think after The Perfect Man, I think she did go through sort of a period of, of um, really kind of looking at herself and what she was going to do and what direction she, she was going. I give a lot of credit to her mom, Susan 
yeah. who, you know, always during Lizzie McGuire, during Cinderella story, she would always tell the crew, you know, don't treat her like a star, treat her like the same respect you'd have for any actress, meaning, you know, you don't have to treat her with kid gloves. And, you know, Susan would always tell me, because I, I asked Susan, how do you raise a, a great kid like that? And she said, chores. That was mm. her, <laughs> that was her suggestion. Give them chores to do. And I wish I had taken that more to heart because of my daughter, it was challenging to get her to do chores. And Susan raised her right. And Hillary really had her head screwed on right and didn't let the fame really get to her in that way. Yeah. Working with Hillary, I mean, anything else you want to say about that? And have you kind of followed the trajectory of her life and career afterwards? I haven't followed her that much. Um, I'm, you know, aware of some things. I, I um, would get together with Susan over the years and, and had maintained a relationship with her. Um, you know, was happy to see all the things Hillary was going through, marriage, kid. Was it kids now? Is it more than Yeah, one? yeah. And one more on the way. Yeah. Wow. So she, that's great. I mean, I think she's really living the life that she should be, you know, a full life of, of family as well as acting. Um, she was always grounded in that way. And it doesn't surprise me that she values those family things. It's not just about acting for her, even though she always came to everything with complete professionalism, willing to try stuff. She was an acrobat. This just suddenly came into my mind. In, in Lizzie, she really wanted to do something in one of the episodes where she, in fact, I think we finally got her to do some handsprings and some, she, you know, she had a lot of talents. And um, I think the dramatic side of her was never really tapped into. I think a lot of people kind of put her in the same world as the Olsen twins. And I mm -hmm. think, I think Hillary was much more than that and um, had, had a lot more to offer. What do you have to say about the lasting impact of, of these movies you directed, the shows, everything? I mean, not just the Hillary projects, even Life Size and Model Behavior and even Stevens. I mean, you've really had an imprint on kids who grew up in the 90s, 2000s, the entertainment that we uh, grew up watching. Well, I, you know, it totally surprises me every time, you know, I get a call like this and it warms my heart that I was able to, to do that. I, I feel so honored that these have stuck around, you know, and, and have made a real uh, imprint on people. I hope it's to the better. Um, they were, you know, super fun to make. We never thought anybody would ever watch them again kind of thing certainly didn't know that they would have a life um, as long as this. And, you know, just really happy that they have. I think they, I think those movies had sort of a wholesomeness, a funness to them and a sweetness. And I think that was always my attempt and sort of my brand, so to speak, was about comedy with heart. And the heart was very important to me. I, I didn't ever want to make a film that only had a comedic side. I really um, feel that the films that connect with people, and I think the reason that those films have stuck around is they have heart. They, they have something that's going on for the characters that people resonate with, that um, they feel a connection emotionally. It's not just the enjoyment of watching the comedy part of it, but feeling a connection to the characters. And I think that's what's made it special. Thank you very much for, for a great part of our childhood. And Mark Rosman, thanks so much for being on Deaf Enough. I know, like I said at the, the top of the show, the fans are really going to enjoy hearing from you. So appreciate your time. Well, I appreciate you, Wit, and I appreciate um, all the fans that are still sticking with Hillary and uh, the sort of amazing career that she carved out. And I'll say hi back to all the fans and especially to Hillary. Um, I wish you well. And that's all for this episode of Duff Enough. Thanks again for listening. I hope you'll subscribe and stick around for more because this podcast is what dreams are made of. You can follow along on social media at Duff Enough Pod and check the description for my socials as well as show guests. And until next time, bye Team Duff!
Justin Timberlake was in, um, oh my God, uh, what's the name of his group? In Sync. <laughs>